that's, uh, that's HE for you. Um, so yes, and we've recently celebrated 50 years of, of uh, delivering archaeology uh, at Lampeter. Um, and uh, so since uh, for 10 years now, we've been called UWTSD. But uh, as I say, we're used to nobody knowing who we are. That's all right. Um, uh, so to start off with, to think, to just thinking about the, you know, the, in a way, although that's brilliant, I think that that has um, in the past been unhelpful to the profession because there's a feeling that people already have got all the skills they need and therefore all you need to do is give them the experience. And I think that there's a slight sort of a downside to that positive. And of course, you know, and of course you know, there's always that question of, well, do you need a degree to dig? Well, no, you don't. But do you need to do a degree or degree level skills to do complicated things later on in your career? Well, perhaps you do. I mean, I think there's the, there's that question, you know, sort of, yeah, um, but the question of timing, you know. Okay, um, and so as I said, sort of in terms of, okay, once people have started, um, certainly in the past, this has been the, this has been the, the landscape of, of um, staff development. I mean, this is interesting to hear a, 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 an employer really addressing that. I mean, I think that's that, you know, that's that's brilliant, but it is, or certainly has been in the past, unusual that most employers don't do that. Um, typically, they're, they're, the most employers have been not investing that much in terms of their staff development, in terms of our, both in terms of spending money, sending them on courses or equally in spending the time in, in, and, and put, putting the effort into getting people to develop. Um, and there's always issues saying, OK, well, if you've got a, an organisation that's relatively stable, then you don't need to train people for the next, their, next, their next role. You know, they're, they're stuck where they are, so therefore... Um, uh, and again, perhaps that's, that's, that's changing. Um, and there was also, and again, given the fact that everybody in the... Well, a lot of the people in the profession have got academic qualifications. There's, there, there is a, perhaps a surprising scepticism about the value of those qualifications um, that people will discount, say, oh, that, you know, you've got an, uh, an academic MA, but that probably didn't teach you anything that's helpful, um, which is perhaps a bit of a sad thing to hear from, from an HE perspective. I should say, so I'm using HE to mean high, higher education. I realise there's a bit of confusion with historic England in the ring. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, we, uh, we, come, we come from different worlds. Um, so yeah, but so, and it's interesting that say, there has always been that tension between employers not necessarily investing in their staff development and complaining about skill shortages. Um, those two things have been, you know, sort of that slightly paradoxical. You think, well, there's a solution here. Um, and so again, this is picked out from the, um, uh, uh, the landlord report. So identifying where the skill gaps are, it comes and goes in terms of what particular skill gaps there are. But basically, employers spend a lot of their time complaining that they can't recruit the staff to do the work they need to do because there are skill gaps. And so, you know, when, when you talk to employers, these are the things that they will complain about. They will say, oh, well, we, we can't get, we can't, be, there's work we can't do because the specialists aren't available because they're retiring. Um, and there's shortages, you know, and they, you know they're, they're, again, literally, there's projects that cannot progress because we cannot get a, a, a particular body of work being done. Um, there's a whole issue about um, whether you've got people who, you know, sort of in a way, you've got, if you've got employees, if they're in-house, you, you've got control over them, you can prioritise their work for them, you can build them into work programmes and so on. Um, if you're relying on subcontracting people out or, or sort of bringing in specialists, um, then you don't have that level of control. And certainly in terms of risk management, you know, as soon as you're saying you're relying on someone's availability and they're not directly your employee, then straight away you've got a question mark there. Um, issues with long lead times, that basically organising things in order to get sort of particularly specialist input um, creates delays so that post-ex, I mean, in terms of actual days of work, it might be quite minimal, it might be five days' work, but if they can't do it for five years, then you've got a project that's waiting on hold for that long. Um, lack of flexibility, yeah, sort of, um, which ties in with that. Um, 
and of course, you know, again, thinking think specifically around sort of the whole area about specialist practice, um, that each specialist has their own little way of doing things, and there may be inconsistencies with that, which down the line may, may cause issues. Um, I know I, I spent some time synthesizing animal bone uh, data from, uh, from, from one particular area, and uh, one of the things was that every single bone report was different, done by different people, different, different methodologies, um, different quantifications, and trying to actually turn that into useful general data is, is and I think that will come up in the fines, fines, fines workshop this afternoon. Um, and so, yeah, in general, so what the employers are saying, um, there's, there, because of those skill gaps, that's causing delays in terms of finishing reporting and, and, and finishing projects, and therefore depositing the archives. And having lots of undeposited archives or incomplete projects is a big major issue. It's probably too small for you to read. Um, but the, the, the headline figure there is saying that basically there's, there's, there's a thousand cubic meters of undeposited archives and, and, and or incomplete projects sitting on shelves within the archaeology in the UK. That has a cost to it. Somebody has to look after those shelves. And it also means that all those things aren't finished. Um, and so that is, that's, you know, there's a real cost, so there's a bit of a pain in terms of having incomplete projects, but there's also um, a genuine cost in terms of having that. So that's a set of problems, if you like, that the, that the employers and the sector had. Um, so I'm talk, talking now about sort of a, a partial solution that's, that's being developed. So apprenticeship, I'm going to give you a quick, quick, quick introduction to the whole thing about apprenticeships. Um, uh, so Apprenticeships, they're, they're, they're handled in a, in a, by, in a devolved, by the devolved governments, so it's different solutions for different bits, bits of the country. But across the UK, all large employers have to pay a payroll tax, um, uh, regardless of whether they actually have any apprentices or not. They just have to pay the tax because it's, 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 it's an extra, extra tax on, on, on employing people. Um, uh, I mean, they, they may or may not notice, but, the, but they are paying in. Um, and specifically in terms of England, um, the delivery of apprenticeships, um, the, the apprenticeship programmes are developed by the by IFAID, the Institute for App Apprenticeships and Technical Education. It was very confusing. At one point, they were called they called, them, called themselves IFA, which uh, <laughs> which uh, which led to a bit of confusion. Um, but anyway, so IFAID is nice, 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 nice way to find. And the, the funding is, is government funding comes through ESFA. Um, uh, so they're, they're the bodies who are driving it from the government point of view uh, because they're collecting this money as a tax and then they're basically spending that money on providing the apprenticeships. That's the way the structure works. Okay, so what do we mean by an apprenticeship? Uh, it's not, an apprentice isn't a free member of staff. You have to, they're, they're, they're employees, you have to pay them. Um, and employers are a bit disappointed when they hear that. <laughs> have to pay. Um, yeah, but, you know, so it's recognize that they're there, they're, they're there. Um, the key thing is that they are there's training costs for their development are covered by the by the government um, so that so that that training is effectively free um, except you know, obviously you have to release release the person to undertake the training and there's a commitment there to say the employer is going to release them for 20 percent of their time to undertake off the job training um, so it's well, it, modeled on day release although it doesn't have to be one day a week um, so yeah, so, so basically you've got an, an employee who is most of the time working and then one day a week they're, they're, they are doing, doing that learning. Uh, so I think have to have a standard which defines the knowledge, skills and behaviours for a particular job role. They say this is what you need to learn and that's what you'll be learning over the course of the apprenticeship. And at the end of that, if you can demonstrate you've got those KSBs, um, then you, 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 you can go through an assessment and say, right, you now know that, therefore you, you've completed your apprenticeship, you get a certificate. Um, so that's the process. I should say knowledge comes behaviour, so, so it's, it's broadly equivalent to the NOS. Um, I can't what, come in what their terminology is, but it's broadly the same. But KSBs is the, is the term of art uh, within our apprenticeships. So how does the IFAC actually devise these, these standards relating to a particular job role? Um, they, they put together a trailblazer group which, in which are represented employers, training providers, and stakeholders. So in the case of the archaeology ones, um, Historic England and CIFA are part of that stakeholder process. So the idea is what you're trying to do is develop um, uh, apprenticeships which actually address the real needs of the profession 
rather than leaving training providers to think what might be helpful, uh, which um, you know, maybe have happened in the past. So starting, and the start idea is you start from what the job role is that you're, you th you're, you're defining, then identify the KSB that are needed to perform that role effectively, um, and then, then you work on, say, okay, well, how do we check that they've got those KSPs embedded by assessing it? So that's, that, that's, that's the, the, the way it's developed. And the funding level for each of these programs is set by AFAC. They say, well, we think that program of work um, for the training provider costs 15,000 pounds or whatever. Um, and uh, the, the, within the historic environment sector as a whole, and there's a whole, a whole, a whole strat, a range of different um, uh, uh, standards that have been developed. Um, I don't know how well you can see all that, but at, at the top there, you've got the archaeological technician, level three, which is intended to be effectively a conversion program for people with substantial um, field experience, but maybe not a, a degree in archaeology. So it's basically providing them with a, an alternative pathway um, there in terms of accessing those skills. And then you've got the historic environment advice assistant level four, um, and an advisor at level seven there, um, and some conservation ones as well. And at the bottom here, the archaeological specialist level seven, that's the program that I, I'm, I'm currently involved with. And if you're not familiar with the way these levels work, level three is MVQ stroke A level, level four is the first year university or HNC, level six is completion of an undergraduate degree, and level seven is uh, postgrad or masters. Okay, so the, so the archaeological specialist apprenticeships is defined as level seven, um, and it's designed for people who are early mid-career responsible for data analysis and reporting. That they're basically we're looking at people who are going to be in a role where they're expected to take main control of the generation of a completed report, and applying their archaeological judgment um, to, to, to direct that work. So that's, that's really where, where we are. People who've gone, come, come through the experience of doing some data, data gener generation, whether in the field or, or um, in the office, um, but they're getting that point where they're, they are supposed to be standing alone and getting on with it. <coughs> so so um, say it's called archaeological specialist, but we, we mean specialist in something. Um, so not just finds, uh, project management as well, um, or paleo or geophysics or whatever. Uh, say taking on MC for level responsibilities. Um, and the way we do it in terms of delivery, it's a master's program, and then they do a work-based project at the end um, it, and present a portfolio demonstrating that they've met the KSBs. Sorry, am I a glass of water down there? Yes, I find a few more. Uh, <laughs> geez, I'm sound, sound like I'm, 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 I'm crying. Oh, it's so sad. Um, so you can't read this. Um, but these are, these, are, these are defining what the knowledge, skills, and behaviours are. So, uh, so, it's, so this is under knowledge. So relevant primary and secondary data and sources relating to archaeology. Um, and as you, in a way, that's as long as a piece of string. Um, at a very basic level, you say, oh, we, we covered that in, in day one of our, our degree. Um, um, on a sophisticated level, you say, well, that, that could be reading every single book ever written about archaeology. So um, <laughs> but that's, that's, that, that's what they are. So there's a shopping list here. Those are the knowledge bits, skills bits, and B is the behaviours. And it's interesting, sort of, we were talking earlier about mindset, that, yes, what we say is, we, in order to perform a job effectively, then we need to be able to um, behave with a correct attitude, um, you know, and, and so, you know, that, that's built, built in. Okay, um, and one of the things about the government says is we don't want to pay, pay money to teach people stuff they already know. Um, so basically what we do with each, with each apprentice is we assess at the, when, they, when they come into the course about what they already know and therefore we don't have to teach them things they do, they, they, they do know. But what we have found is that most of the people, however well qualified they are in academic terms, um, that they actually need um, you know, there's the, the substantial bodies of skills, sk skills and knowledge that they, they, that they don't currently have. Um, particularly, I'd say, identifying things which are difficult to learn on the job. Um, so, stuff to do with theory and techniques, high-level reporting and publication. You know, you may, you may, you know, it's difficult to develop field skills, which will then sort of lead you to that. And we've already heard mindset several times this session. Um, a change in mindset, 
We want people to be independent archaeologists, confident in their own judgment. Um, and that's a change from being told what to do. You know, we're used to having people looking over our shoulder and, and advising us. The, the way that the university has, has um, approached developing a program which meets this standard um, uh, is so we, uh, we took part in the Trailblazer group, so we were in, in those discussions it's about what the role is and how it might work. Um, we we so I put their redesign in the MA to address the KSB. We basically chucked out our older MA course um, and said, okay, well, you know, we, this is what we want to get to in terms of our KSBs, so therefore we'll devise a program that meets them, um, which has actually been a very helpful, refreshing approach um, because universities will, if, 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 uh, if they have a chance, they will reuse stuff they're already delivering um, you know, for perfectly good reasons. Um, you know, they want to don't want to reinvent the wheel, but this is a different wheel. Um, uh, and also, one of the other things I've been thinking about is the way we teach masters, um, uh, we think about pedagogy, or in this case, andragogy, which you may, with a term you may come across. Um, teaching adults is different to teaching children. Adults have different expectations, different, different, different styles of learning. We're talking to employees who are on the job, completely comp competent people, organised people. Um, we don't have to worry about whether they're going to be late for the course because it's work, they'll, 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 they'll do it, that's about, you know, that, and there's sort of positives and negatives there. But in particular, adults expect to take control of their own learning. And they will ask awkward questions, they will demand resources. So we don't spoon feed them with lots of stuff, we tell them, we, we, we accept them questions and leave them to go and find out the answers themselves. Common features across all of the specialisms, say the specialist is a, is a big bucket, but there are common features to it all. They all involve a project life cycle, and they all involve professional practice. So whether they're dealing with the bone, bones, or whether they're dealing with pottery, or whether they're dealing with project management um, of, of a fieldwork project, um, they, they will be involved in those, those elements. And so that's the way we've divided up the, 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 the course. Um, uh, so as we look at research methods, and then run through, uh, we've just did, finished uh, de delivering the project planning module, um, spending a lot of time working through what, how you develop a more propo project proposal um, and all the bits and pieces that go into that. What is the risk log? How do you budget for projects? Um, uh, how, do you, how do you approach the question of managing, uh, managing project risk? Um, who's responsible for what? Um, uh, you know, sort of all, all basically getting them ready to say, okay, if they ever have to, when they come to do that in, in their professional life, They'll be completely relaxed about it and say, right, I understand the process. Let's just get on with it. OK, um, and at the end, there's a work-based dissertation, basically using, using the, the work they're doing during the day. Um, and they're going to be synthesizing that to that highest level of um, publication level analysis. And possibly not published this time, but, but so that they can demonstrate that they, they, they're, they're ready, ready for, for when they come to do that. Okay, in terms of how we actually deliver it, um, say it's one day a week, it's that 20%. Uh, so Wednesday is our teaching day. We have a three hour Zoom session in the morning and um, we, we do deliberately make it quite relaxed because three hours is a long time. Um, uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's how it is, you know, sort of the pattern works. Um, and the idea is that the, the rest of their time, the rest of that 20%, they, they go away and, and follow up uh, the topics that we've covered in, in, the, in, the, te in the teaching sessions. Um, so, uh, and we look at real world cases all the time. We're looking at real examples of this is a project design, a real project design that happened. Um, and, and we've also drawn on our extensive experience. Because one of the key things is, I think it came up earlier about sort of how, how, we, how we learn and, and fail and so on. Um, the, the best way of learning a lesson is, is for a project to go wrong. Nobody ever forgets a project that goes wrong. Um, the best we can do from that is to learn from it and hopefully share, but don't do that. Um, you know, I, I, I spent a long time saying, don't forget VAT when you're doing the costing. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that, you know, everybody's got a VAT. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, and one of the key things, as I say, all, as I say teaching it, it makes it sound like it's, it's very um, lecture-based, but it's absolutely not. Um, and we deliberately structured the program so that there's lots of, of um, uh, role play and scenarios so that people are getting the feel of what's it like to be in a project team meeting? What's it like to chair a project team meeting? People won't have done that before. Um, and it's actually quite helpful to, 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 to do that. Okay, so, um, so we're in the middle of our, our first year of delivery. We've got four employers currently represented on the program. Um, and the, 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 the apprentices we're dealing with um, are specialising in project management, field, field work project management, uh, post tax mainly for pottery. We were expecting there to be lots more fines people, but um, not this time. And uh, in terms of the feedback from the apprentices, in terms of um, uh, you know, that, what their response is, are we getting this right? Um, they said, well, actually, one of the issues is you know, one day a week is a bit disruptive, um, uh, and you know, there, there are inevitably work, you know, there ha things happen in terms of work, they're suddenly required on site somewhere else and they can't attend. Uh, we record the sessions so they can, they, they can catch up, but uh, you know, that is a challenge, no, no getting away from that. Um, they've said that it's very helpful for them to actually reflect on their practice, you know, the stuff that they've been doing routinely um, as part of their day-to-day -day work, but they'll suddenly ask the question, why do you do it that way? And why do you do it that way when somebody else is doing it a different way? So it's a very interesting question, um, because you know, it's, sort of, it's, it's easy for people to become quite um, insular about, oh, well, this is, this is the modal way of doing things, um, rather than saying, well, well, yes, that's one choice, but there's other people are doing it different ways. Um, and they've said that it increases their confidence in their work. They feel that right, they've really got a handle on, on what they're doing, what they should be doing, um, and increases the quality of their work. They're doing it better than they were before. Which, Good to hear. I mean, you know, given that we're only a few months into the program, it's good to play good to get this back. Um, and they really enjoyed um, that, that role play. I mean, I think it's something most people, well, I would say, a lot of people would run away from anything that's labelled for role play. So we try not to call it, we don't call it that. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but they have actually been very helpful. And the discussions we've had in those programs um, has actually been re really helpful. The people learning from each other rather than learning from us. Um, because, you know, you have different organisations explaining where they're coming from. Okay, um, and I asked, I asked the apprentices what's the best thing they learned so far. Um, so there's a set of quotes, I'll, I'll read them out in case you can't hear them. A greater understanding of our political practice in the real world, uh, which is quite good for someone who's already doing it. And, you know, that's quite surprising. Uh, detail on ethical practice. Ethics is one of the strands that comes, comes through all the time. It's one, it's one of the KSBs. Um, so we really emphasise that what's the right thing to do. And in particular, we, again, you're drawing on our real-world experience. We know that in most cases, there's no one right answer. There's a compromise. You do what the best you can in the circumstances. And, um, you know, and we really we hammered that home, that, uh, you know, that we're making judgments all the time. But the hope, best you can hope for is you make the right call or the best call you can in the circumstances uh, and not worry about the fact it's not perfect. Um, here we are. The range of method stroke software within the commercial sector, again, stuff that's out there, tools that are out there, being used by other, other employers but not by, by them. Uh, archaeological theory is not as irrelevant as I once thought. Um, we actually tied, tied theory into the whole question about um, public archaeology, public benefit, um, and you know, the, the idea of you know, why are we doing archaeology in the first place. Um, and so it was actually quite interesting um, in the context that we, we, we kept on Black Lives Matter. Matter kept that keep coming up, um, saying, okay, well, you know, what, to what extent is archaeology a political activity? Um, and in some ways it isn't, in some ways it really is. Um, uh, a love for archiving and metadata, whereas before I could barely describe it. So that absolute, you know, that absolute win there. Somebody, somebody who would previously not have been engaged at all with it, and in fact uh, that their role is now, she's, uh, that she's now specialising in, in dealing with that for the whole organisation. Um, she's just taken up and run with it. And then engaging with other professions, professionals in the same stage of their career is, is eye-opening. Yes, yeah, because there's just a team of people who are new to roles um, and, um, you know, I say a range of confidences in, in their roles, uh, but certainly they're all, they're all at that point where they're learning lots of stuff. Okay, so from the university's point of view, having developed this program, um, what my, my, my reflections because I think that's one of the key things is, you know, 
it's, it's easy to teach people to reflect, and sometimes we forget to actually do the reflection ourselves. Um, so yes, it's not a rebranded old MA, and that's, I'm sure I say absolutely that was the right choice. Um, that we could have um, sort of uh, tried to fudge it a bit, um, but we did the right thing by saying no, this is going to be a new program. Um, one of the issues we've had is it that the employers say, oh, there's a skill gap here, we need, we need this program. Um, and it has been more of a struggle than I'd thought to get employers to say, oh, this is such a brilliant program, we need to send people on it. Um, you know, that, that, uh, and so that's something you know, that we've learned. And that's affected into our delivery time scales um, because we need to have a certain minimum cohort size to, to, to run it. Um, we've promoted student driven level study. Again, a taught MA is often quite didactic in terms of its, its sort of teaching style. Um, we're absolutely not, but that does mean we have to do extra work. I mean, that's the, the downside. Well, it's really enjoyable, but the downside is we have to uh, um, put the time in to making sure that we are giving the students the individual guidance they need. Um, and the, the other thing that I think you know, really has helped, as I mentioned about lessons learned, um, is that it's helped that, that the teaching team are actually familiar with um, the workings of commercial archaeology. Um, and again, I think people would be right to be sceptical about uh, sort of archaeology courses across the sector, which are being taught by people who have been wholly academic their entire career. Um, as it happens, um, that doesn't apply that the, that the, that the students aren't in that position, um, that, that we, we do have um, genuine sector experience to, to call upon. So, um, I, I, so I feel like I've sort of gone a long way um, and my voice is dying, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, if this is an opportunity for specifically, I'm thinking about if employers are seeing this is something that they could re really use to, in order to invest in the development and, uh, uh, and, pr and progression of some of their staff. It doesn't have to be a new member of staff, it can be, can be an existing member of staff. Um, alternatively, people who are, who sound, this sounds like a brilliant program, um, uh, we can't make, wave a magic wand and create a, create a role, but it's something, something you might want to mention. If, if, you're, if you ever get into an interview and they say, what are your plans? You say, well, actually, this sounds like that would be the best programme for me to be if you, when you employ me. Okay, thank you very much.